I'm out in a field with me photographer looking for bits of broken pottery, okay? And uh, she's off ahead of me. We'd found loads of bits of pottery at the back of this farm. Uh, and she picks a stone up this. Now, the way I'm holding it now, it does just look like a stone. It's just a rock. And she went to throw it down the field. And I saw her doing this and I thought, I wonder if she's found anything. She stopped. Because what I'd said to her was, if anything looks interesting, pick it up and pass it to me. And she brought it to me and she says, well, it does look interesting because it's got a spike on top. See the spike? And on the reverse, exact reverse side to the spike, it's been battered. You see that? It's battered on top and it's got a spike on the bottom. So I said to her, well, it's unusual because you don't get flint in Cheshire. Okay, so that's, that doesn't belong there. So I said, pick up any other bits of flint we can find. So the average size room, like the room we're in now, in that area, we picked all these pieces of flint up, okay? That, at some point, we think has had an edge on it. Um, that one still has an edge on it, still got a cutting edge. They're very primitive. That one's been bashed. Someone's had a go at bashing it just for a laugh, not really got anywhere. So you could say they were tools. I'll just put these down. There we go. These, every single one of these has been burnt in a fire. And what they used to do was they would heat stones, handfuls of stones, and drop them into the pots to heat the liquid because the pots, if they were put on fires, would explode because they hadn't been fired. So these are what are called pot boilers. That one's a fragment that's actually bl blasted off a bigger piece. The piece that, 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 that's been heated has exploded. So those are four pot bo boilers. So we've got three tools, four pot boilers, and this big axe thing here. I took that to an expert friend of mine, uh, Dr Rodney Bagley, who has sadly passed away, but he was the librarian at Cambridge, and I handed him that, and I said, what do you make of this? It's an old tool, you know, is, is it, what, 10,000 years, 12,000 years, how old is it? So he took it off me and he looked at it, and he went, oh, I don't know exactly what that is. He said, uh, where do you get it from? I said, well, I picked it off a field in Mere. And he said, no, you're having me on, lad, stop joking, tell me where it really came from. I said, no, it really, really did, it came off a field in Mere. And he went very quiet, and he said, well, he said, that, is a Hoxnian chipping tool. It's a chipping axe for splitting meat. Again, it's, it's a, a hammer. It's actually held with that against the thumb and it's held like that. Very small hands, much smaller than ours, and it's used in a hammering motion. And he said, uh, he said, well, your photographer lady, he said, has just rewritten British history. I said, oh, why is that? He said, well, that's 400 to 480,000 BC. That's twice the age of the Ilfordian tools. They know that because in Hoxney they can actually carbon date the deposits that these axes come out of and they're only made at that time period, they're made by Homo erectus, the first kind of um, version of modern man. So that is 480,000 BC and with the other tools it means that Cheshire was not under ice during the Hoxney and interglacial. So instead of the glacier coming all the way down to Birmingham and that's it, nothing at all north of Birmingham, that glacier must have retreated all the way back into Lancashire leaving the Cheshire Ridge clear for these guys to come along and hunt. So that is officially the oldest man-made object in Cheshire. How are things dated then? If we're talking the sort of age of, of these items, then they start the fossil record. So you're talking about geological time scale. So uh, these dates are based on the deeper things are, the older they are. And then they look at the carbon content mainly for carbon-14 dating, because we know how fast it takes for carbon to decay. Um, you can tell how long that thing's been there. That's roughly how it works. So with the Hoxnian stuff, we know that there's carbon deposits with those tools. You can date the carbon deposits and that will give you a reasonably reliable idea of where it is. There's lots of other things. You can look at the environment that things are found in. Um, and plant seeds, animal remains, um, even snail shells. Certain species are only around at certain times. Um, for example, you're not going to get anything alive under a sheet of ice. So if the ice is there, you get a big blank with nothing. And then when the ice retreats, you get different types of animals and flora and fauna coming in. In modern day time scales, anything from sort of the Stone Age up, up to modern day, we've got a rough idea of how that time scale works anyway. Um, there's historical records going all the way back to ancient Egypt. They've got chronologies of various kinds. Um, but then it becomes cultural. The dating is more cultural. If you know what style the object is, you can fit it into various parts, various sequences. Archaeology works very much like geology. Depending on how deep it is, it depends on how old it is. Don't you love ooh parts? Out of place objects, things that are where they're not supposed to be. Uh, well, the Ice Age tools are a prime example of ooh parts. You know, how can they be there when we're supposed to be under a sheet of ice? I mean, it, that, that, that theory that we were under ice is destroyed by the fact that the tools are here. Um, 
Gosh, I personally haven't picked anything up that I felt shouldn't be in a particular location. I've not, you know, found um, a spark plug on a Roman site or, a, you know, a Coke can sticking out of sand in ancient Egypt. Or I've not found anything as crazy as that. Um, with archaeology, it's more a case of, of moving the goalposts a bit. Um, a good example of that is um, apparently, apparently, there was no evidence for Saxons or Vikings in Britain. Now, that would have been true about 30 years ago. There wasn't really any evidence for the Anglo-Saxons or for the Vikings. So the Romans move out and there's nothing. That was the general opinion, there's nothing. That's why it was called the Dark Ages. Until they created an amnesty for metal detectorists. And then all of a sudden, with the Portable Antiquities Scheme, they've got tens of thousands of metal objects coming in that date from the Saxon period into the Viking period. And the only reason that that period was missing is nobody had ever looked in the right place for the right objects. So literally, I mean, there's one finds officer that tells this story where um, they're supposed to record every object, you know. And this old, very elderly metal detectorist turned up with all the stuff he'd found for about 30, 40 years in a bucket. And there were 34,000 objects in this bucket. So you imagine you just walked up like that and went, there you go, record that lot, you know. And that literally, the metal detectorists have put about four or five hundred years of missing history back into archaeology. So that again, this is where the U parts, the missing parts come. People have to guess the age of, of like these isolated objects that they've got. And then when all the gaps get filled in, they usually get moved, things get shuffled around and it's realised that sometimes they're not in the right place. A good example is the Benty Grange helmet, uh, which is in Sheffield. Um, it's definitely Saxon in design. It's the nearest helmet we've got to what King Arthur would have worn because it's from that period. It's, it's, the, the official view is that it's somewhere in the 600s. So it's supposed to be contemporary in date with, say, the Sutton Hoo helmet. But in actual fact, I think it's older. I think it's in the 500s. But it's dated based on its style. Now, I don't see that its style fits the Sutton Hoo. You know, it's, it's distinctly different in influence. So if I was to date it, if somebody turned up and placed it on my table, I'd stick it in the 500s, not the 600s. But ordinary, average, everyday, straightforward archaeology says it ought to be in the 600s, but without really good reason for that, because we just don't know anything about the 500s. There isn't enough information there to move it back. I think you've got to, you've got to switch your brain off to ignore the facts, to stay within the orthodox view of archaeology. I think if you switch your brain on and you actually look at the facts, you realise that people in the past knew far more than we think they knew. Um, there's examples in Egypt, for example, of vessels that are made from aluminium. They've got the Saqqara glider, which is this small child's toy, which when you stick the wings on it, it actually flies. You know, it's aerodynamically spot on. There's things found in um, prehistoric caves, go back to 30, 40, 50, 60,000 BC. Little bones shaped like eyes. When you flick them one way, they spin. When you flick them the other way, they rattle back because they go a couple of turns and then they go back the other way. And the aerodynamics required to shape the bones to do that are just unbelievable. The mathematics involved, these things are turning up all the time. They're quite common. So it's obvious that they knew something about dynamic technology to be able to do that. And it is actually the, the force you put into it. It's a law of physics that it, it goes back. It'll only spin in one direction. You know? and, and all these things are there in the primitive record. But if you ignore them, then everything's fine. You know, yeah, it works. Archaeology and everything works. But then there's always this thing that pops up to upset the apple cart, you know. I think it's in the temple at Dendara, you've got these huge light bulbs depicted down on the, in the basement in the carvings there. They look like big light bulbs with sort of cables coming off and a battery and what looks like an insulator. Well, Von Daniken made one of those to the exact specifications, plugged it in and the whole thing lit up. Um, I've got to tell you actually, there's an interesting twist in that. Some of the tombs in Egypt, you have to go through an entranceway, down a corridor, down a flight of steps, down a shaft, round a bend, down another shaft, round a corner, into the tomb. You know, the, the, you're miles underground and all of a sudden, as soon as you put an electric light on, an electric torch, you discover the roof's painted white. Question, how? If you've only got sooty oil lamps or burning pieces of cloth, how can you paint a clean ceiling white? How did they do it? There's no way you can possibly use mirrors or get light in there. They must have had some way, some source of clean light to do it. That's all over Egypt, the entire of Egypt. It's just a perfectly intelligent question. How? How do you paint a ceiling when you're so far away from a light source? 
electric light bulbs? Possibly. That's Von Daniken's. I've got to give him credit for that one. But there you go. The internet's a good thing. That's that's spreading a lot of of this information out. Sort of 20, 30, 40 years ago, you'd have to go and buy one of Eric's books or Andrew Thomas's books or one or two of the other famous authors out there that, that delved into it. There is information out there that most people don't have access to. And every so often you do blunder across it. You know, maybe the basement of the Vatican's got it all or, you know, CIA have got it or whatever. There is information out there that they have that nobody else has for whatever reason, okay? They've, they've deemed that, that that needs to be the case, be it religion, politics, economy, whatever. Mm -hmm. Very recently, there's a big interest in giants. There's a lot of giant things turning up. Um, there's tales of human bones where you've got sort of a leg bone, if you like, the height of a human being. So you're talking about giant figures being discovered possibly as high as 30 or 40 feet, which is biblical. You know, the David and Goliath story, they're all given in cubits, which amount to quite a considerable size. Um, but then again, also, you see, you've got the other thing happening because you've recently found these, these tiny little pygmy humans. That is an archaeological factual discovery that up to 30,000 years ago, these little guys that are sort of three feet high were living on an island. You know, they were a separate, separate race. So um, there's so much out there. I think there's so much we've lost. You know, um, good story for you that somebody uh, gave me ages ago. They said if there was such a thing as Noah's Ark and the Flood, up to the point where the world gets destroyed and Noah builds his ark, that society had 3,000 years of technological development to arrive at that point. We, at this particular point in history, have only had 2,000 years. So even Noah in the Bible, even his culture, he had 1,000 years longer to develop. That culture developed 1,000 years longer than ours. So where are we going to be 1,000 years from now? So I think constantly in the past we've had these periods, these massive periods of development where man has gone off and done exactly what we're doing now and come up with different solutions and different inventions and different discoveries. And then it all gets wiped out for one reason or another. You're back to the start, you start again, you know. I think that's just gone on over and over again. That's, that's easily provable from geology and archaeology, that things happen and then they get wiped out, you know. You've got nuclear blasts in India, you've got these giant blocks lifted in parts of Peru and Baalbek and the temples of, of South America, you've got all sorts of things going on. Crystal skulls that we can't copy. The longer answer is a story. And it starts with the Greeks, and it starts with a king who decided to gather all the information from the ancient world together into one place. And that gave birth to the Library of Alexandria, okay? So they brought all the scrolls, all the writings, all the tablets from all over the planet. So you imagine that, right? Two and a half thousand years ago, everything's there, right in front of you. And they copied it all, and they created the library. But the trouble is, when you put all your information, all your eggs in one basket, it's an easy target. And four times that Library of Alexandria was burnt over a period of several hundred years. It got to the point where, I won't say who was responsible, but at one point, one of the invaders were using the scrolls to fire the bread ovens. Now you imagine what was burnt. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of scrolls burnt. The original copies may have survived, but most of that information will have gone up in smoke. Now that was, that was the ancient world. They were burning the ancient world. Now occasionally we do blunder across gatherings, collections of scrolls and things that some are readable, some are not, from that, from that period and before. But that's how the world works. Things get scattered. What would I like to find? Well, in the next couple of years, I'm going off chasing King Arthur. So it'd be very nice to have his crown, to have his sword, to have the Holy Grail. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll say it'd be nice to have answers. It'd be nice to know what it was, where it is, you know, uh, who had it, what happened to it. So hopefully in the next sort of year or two, as I'm looking into King Arthur, I might come up with some answers. But I do feel as if I'm very, very close. Sometimes I think different people with different interests come along and one person can tackle a subject and get nowhere. And another person can tackle a subject and doors start to open. And I just feel as if, down the years, although I've not deliberately aimed for it, I think doors have opened. And um, I've got a rough idea where a few things are, so we'll see where it leads me. But then again, would I tell anyone if I knew? <laughs>